This video discusses the procedure for double displacement reactions for general chemistry at Madison College. For this experiment, you're going to be setting up many different double displacement reactions. And to organize your reactions, you're going to be doing them in these microwell plates that look like this. The first thing that you want to do is get two 24 well plates and you want to wash these thoroughly with soap water and do a final rinse with deionized water. We reuse these plates so it'll be important to wash them before you start your experiment. You also want to get a laminated template that looks like this. And you can see that on the laminated template there's the chemical formulas for all the reactants that you're going to be using today. And there's also a big black box. And the big black box, the purpose of that is to help you visualize any white precipitates that might form as a result of your double displacement reaction. It can be easier to see those white precipitates if you visualize them against a dark background. You want to arrange your microwell plates on the template like this. And I want to talk about how you start adding your reactants to the wells. So I'm going to start by looking at the different columns. And my columns are at the top and they're labeled A through H. I'm going to start with column A and I see that my chemical formula there is for aluminum nitrate. So I'm going to find the bottle of aluminum nitrate in the lab and I want to add four to five drops of aluminum nitrate to each well going down column A. And I have those wells marked with a red X here. So I'm going to be adding aluminum nitrate to a total of six wells as I go down column A on my table. I'm going to do this um, for columns A through H. So I'm going to repeat this for columns A through H. I'm going to locate the reagent listed at the top and I'm going to be adding it to a total of six wells as I go down each column on my table. At this point in time, you've added one reactant to each well in your plates. And I have a picture of what my plates look like at this point in time, and it's sort of hard to see these clear solutions here. But at this point in time, I have one reactant in each well, or I have some solution in each well, and that represents just one of my reactants. To add the second reactant, I'm going to be looking at the rows on the left-hand side. And my rows are labeled 1 through 6. So I'm going to start at row number 1, which is labeled sodium carbonate. I'm going to find the solution of sodium carbonate in the lab, and I want to add 4 to 5 drops of sodium carbonate to each well going across row 1. And I have those wells marked with a red X here. And you can see that I'm going to be adding sodium carbonate to a total of eight wells as I go across row one on my table. I'm going to repeat this for each row on the table. So I'll keep going down for row two, three, four, five, and six until I've added my second reactant to every well on the plate. At this point in time, you want to observe your reactions and record the results. The thing that you're looking for is you want to find out if a solid forms as a result of the double displacement reaction. If a solid forms, the solution is going to get cloudy. And because you're going to be observing so many different reactions, we have abbreviations that you can use when you're recording your data. If the solution gets cloudy, the thing that you want to record is PPT. And PPT stands for precipitate. That means a precipitate formed as a result of the double displacement reaction. If the solution doesn't get cloudy, the thing you want to record is NVR. And NVR stands for no visible reaction because you don't have any sign of chemical change in that well. I want to take this one step further and I want to talk about what does PPT and NVR means in terms of your double displacement reactions. So if you record PPT, if you observe that a specific reaction gets cloudy, what that means is that the products, one of the products of your double displacement reaction is not soluble in water. It doesn't dissolve in water. If nothing gets cloudy, so if you record NVR for a for one of your wells, 
What that means is that the predicted products of the double displacement reaction are all soluble. Everything stays dissolved in water, and what we would really say is that no reaction occurred, because what you end up with is just a mixture of ions in water for that well. Now using these terms insoluble and soluble, we can translate, translate those into our chemical notation. If a chemical is insoluble, when we write the chemical formula, along with that, we would use the state subscript of an S that stands for solid. It means that it doesn't dissolve in water and you end up with a solid. If something is soluble, that means it does dissolve in water and the state subscript that you would use with your chemical formula would be AQ. It's dissolved in water and what you end up with is an aqueous solution. I want to talk about um, the goal of this lab. So the, the main goal of this lab is you want to end up with solubility rules. So in addition to just observing a whole bunch of double displacement reactions, we want to determine general trends about solubility of different ions. Every reaction that you do is going to be a double displacement reaction. And a double displacement reaction is a reaction between two ionic compounds that rearrange to give two new ionic compounds. One of the products of those double displacement reactions won't be soluble and you'll end up with a solid forming. Now a question you might ask yourself is how do you know if an ionic compound is going to be soluble or insoluble in water? just by looking at the chemical formula. And the answer is, is that you don't. It's something that you have to test, and that's what you're testing in lab this week. So I want to go over how your reactants are organized in this table that's on your laminated template. So I want to look at the different rows on the left. So I'm looking at the rows labeled 1 through 6. And what I want you to notice when you're looking at those chemical formulas is as I go from one row to the next, all of those chemical compounds have sodium as the cation. So as I go from one row to the next, what's changing is the anion. If I look at the top, so now I want to look at the columns here. As I go from one column to the next, what's changing is my cation in this case. The anion is always the same. All of the columns have nitrate as the anion, but what's changing is the cation as I go from one column to the next. So what that means as I'm interpreting my results is if I'm comparing the results from one column to the next, what I'm doing is I'm testing the solubility of different cations. If I'm comparing the results of one row to the next, what I'm doing is I'm testing the solubility of different anions. So how are you going to summarize your data and how are you going to come up with these solubility rules? So I want to show you the data table that um, is in your post lab. And it's labeled with solubility rules and it looks like this. On the left hand side is a list of different ions. So um, this is both cations and anions. And what you want to be able to say is whether ionic compounds formed from that ion are usually soluble or insoluble. And to take this one step further, what you're going to do is locate the ion on your data table and you want to see whether you recorded NVR for the reaction, which means that you saw no visible reaction and everything dissolved in water, or whether you recorded PPT, in which case you would say that um, something precipitated and one of the products of that double displacement reaction is insoluble, in which case you would say that ionic compounds formed from that ion tend to be insoluble. Um, so this is going to be how you summarize your data and come up with solubility rules from your double displacement reactions. In addition to this table, you are going to need to predict products and write balanced chemical equations for five different reactions that you see in the lab. When you're done with all of your observations, 
and you've recorded all of your data, you can pour the solutions from your microwell plates into the sink and you can just wash those out with soap and water and return them to the plastic bin in the front of the lab room. This is the end of the procedure and I hope this video helps you prepare for lab.